thank you, uh, Jeremy, and thanks uh, everyone for tuning in. So, uh, some of you may have seen my presentation before, but uh, I'm going to go through it uh, from the top, um, and I'll uh, try to save some time to answer questions at the end. If you have questions, by all means, throw them into the Q and A box uh, uh, when you uh, want to. So. Uh, in terms of uh, myself, I'm uh, located 15 miles east of San Francisco. Uh, I am the founder of uh, a company called EMQQ Global. We are uh, investors in emerging markets technology companies. Uh, we have three uh, different versions of what we do. The, the main one is uh, EMQQ, which uh, invests in all emerging and frontier market internet companies. Uh, with China being the largest part of that. Uh, FMQQ is the same thing, but without the China portion. And then INQQ is a recently launched uh, uh, offering that just focuses on the Indian internet opportunity. So that's uh, what I do. In terms of my background, I, uh, as I mentioned, I live uh, in San Francisco. I have worked here in the investment business for 30 years. I started at a company called Robertson Stevenson Company which was the leading technology investment bank uh, when I got out of college in 1992. And I had a 20-minute interview, which uh, 19, minutes, 19 minutes of those were devoted to uh, college basketball. And then I got a one-minute overview of the investment business. And then they said, uh, you can start Monday. And I responded by saying, how can I possibly start Monday? I don't know anything about investing. And they said, go buy this book. And they wrote down a random walk down Wall Street. Now, some of you uh, probably know this book, maybe have even read it. Um, it was first written in 1972, 50 years ago. And in that first edition, the author, Princeton economist Bert Malkiel, suggested that somebody should create an index fund. There were no index funds back then, but uh, he suggested it. And others were starting to talk about the idea. Uh, not long later, his friend John Bogle launched Vanguard and the first uh, index fund. So this book and its author have long been associated with indexing. Uh, Burton is a Vanguard board member and was also the chairman of the committee that created the first ETF, the Spider. So this uh, is how I started off my career in reading this book. But I very quickly gravitated towards Omaha. I think about every business and investment decision through a Charlie Munger lens first. And uh, so, but for the last 22 years, I've actually been partners with this guy. And uh, we did a couple things starting in 1999. Um, the first uh, I conceived of and filed a patent on fractional share brokerage, uh, which uh, we commercialized in a form of a company called E-Investing that we sold E-Trade in the year 2000. Uh, we then turned our uh, efforts towards a strategy that's now been uh, named direct indexing, but we called it active indexing and still do. Uh, this is building your own uh, individualized separate accounts to track the S&P on a pre-tax basis, but beat the index on an after-tax basis through loss harvesting and then uh, uh, allowing you to customize for ESG reasons. This also a strategy that's gone somewhat mainstream recently. So we sold the company to Natixis at the end of 2004. Just before that, Google went public. They asked my partner to give a talk about investing, and uh, he did that. I wasn't involved, but uh, the Google went public. And a few months after that, a guy called me and said, hey, I heard about this active indexing. How do I invest? And one thing led to another. Uh, he was a Google engineer and one of the earliest employees. And one thing led to another, and I became his uh, sort of investment advisor as a side job. And so uh, then he started introducing me to his friends at Google. And all of a sudden, I'm going back and forth to Mountain View in the spring of 2005. But Burton was going back and forth to China. And he ends up writing a book about China. The Google people call me and say, can Burton come talk about China? I said, sure, next time he's in San Francisco, we can do that. And that was 16 years ago. And from the moment that talk ended until today, my entire life has ended up focusing on what on earth does that even mean to invest in China uh, and more broadly in emerging markets. So with that background, let me go fast now through what you need to know and then what I think uh, uh, you ought to do 
to capture the, the real growth of this uh, important part uh, of the world, mainly all of the world uh, in many ways. So when we think about what emerging markets are, and we include frontier markets in our offerings, frontier markets are the junior emerging markets, if you will. There's about 46 of these uh, countries. You want to think about the size of this in terms of the population and the economies. It's about 60% Asia, China being the biggest part. It's about 15 to 20% Latin America with Brazil and Mexico being the two largest pieces. And then the rest of it, the other 20 or so percent is spread around Africa, the Middle East, and Eastern Europe, places like Turkey. So that's what it looks like on the map. Fundamentally, it is the world. This is where the vast majority of the world's people are. They're younger, so they're even more of the future. About 90% of the future is uh, in emerging and frontier markets. Their economies have been growing faster than the developed world. But if you look at this slide, you'll see emerging markets share of several different categories, three that have red arrows. The top red arrow is pointing out again, this is where all the people are. The bottom two red arrows are showing you that when it comes to consumption, these people are way behind. And it's the closing of that gap, that delta. That's the story. The thing that's emerging are the people and they want stuff. They are moving on up and they want the things that we take for granted, more and better food, more protein. They want better clothing. They want uh, air conditioners and uh, ovens. They want vacations and uh, entertainment. They want their kids to go to college and they want a nice car. And that's the story. I didn't have to figure this out. It's very well documented. You can see at the bottom, McKinsey calls it the biggest growth opportunity in the history of capitalism. So that's what everybody investing in emerging markets should be focused on. It's the foundation of everything I've done over the last 16 years. And it is ultimately what EMQQ is all about, billions of people moving on up. Now, that's the good side. Now, let me tell you the problems with emerging markets, and there's several, but ultimately, the biggest problem by far is the indexes. The way people are measuring uh, and investing in the equities of uh, emerging and frontier markets. And this is a problem that I learned about in the first five minutes. So after Burton gave his talk, we, it was 16 years ago, we had lunch at Google, and then we drove back to San Francisco, and I went straight over to our portfolio managers, and I said, the Google guys want to invest in China. Give me a list of all the companies in the China ETF with the ticker FXI. That's the iShares China ETF. It was the first China ETF and the only China ETF back then. And I assumed that's what we would use to give investors, uh, these Google people, their exposure. And with my Omaha hat, I wanted to see what the companies were. I don't care about the title of the ETF. I want to know what are the businesses that we are going to be shareholders of. And so I asked for the list. Before they gave me the list, Burton pulled me aside. And he said, look, when you get the list, you're going to see that almost all the companies in the China index and the China ETF are government-owned banks and oil companies. Now, this sounded very bad to me from the beginning, but he then went on to give me an example of how a Chinese state-owned bank might work. And basically, the example was you have a Chinese manufacturing plant that's been losing money for a decade, but it has 15,000 employees and it's about to run out of money again. And so it goes across to the state-owned bank across town and says, hey, we need more money. Now a normal banker would say, no, you can't have any more money because you didn't pay us back the last money. But the state-owned banker says, well, we can't lay off 15,000 people. And so it makes another loan. And that made me uh, sick to my stomach. In Omaha, investing is pretty simple. Earnings have value. And it's the growth of those earnings that grow your value. And if the people that run the companies don't care about that, why would you invest in them at all? Now, in the case of the China fund, it was 80% state-owned enterprises. The broad indexes, the Vanguard, iShares, MSCI, and FTSE-based products, 
it's about a third in these uh, uh, state-owned enterprises. And you don't have to look far to see the corruption. You have people stealing your money left and right, including the last uh, president of Brazil who went to jail and also the chairman of Samsung, which isn't even a state-owned enterprise. The Chabel and the oligarchs have a lot of the same problems. So you got to evolve what you're going to do if you want to make money in emerging markets. And I watched this happen. My first eight years focused on China. I launched some China ETFs with Guggenheim that Invesco now owns. But when I wasn't with the Guggenheim people, I was in Boston and New York with family offices and endowments. And I watched how they were increasing their allocations to emerging markets, but also getting more focused as they got larger. And if you were David Swenson in Yale, well, you could do a whole lot of things, but the average investor couldn't. And so I ultimately concluded that the best emerging markets 3.0 to capture the growth was to simply buy the emerging market consumer stocks, leave out the legacy economy, the oil, the materials, the state-owned banks, leave all that out and go where the growth is. McKinsey's, again, the biggest growth opportunity in the history of capitalism. So I told people that's what they should invest in. And it so happened that somebody made an ETF to track the emerging market consumer sector. It has the ticker symbol ECON. It owned the 30 largest emerging market consumer stocks. And so when people would ask me, what's the best emerging markets ETF? I didn't tell them to buy my China funds. I told them to buy Econ. That's the way to do it. And it was eight years ago that I got a phone call one morning from a friend of mine, and she asked me what was the best emerging markets ETF for her daughter's college fund. And I started to tell her to buy the emerging market consumer ETF, but then I had a light bulb moment, as they say, and I said, wait a minute, the best emerging markets ETF for long-term investors doesn't exist. And I went straight back to my office and I started to organize EMQQ that afternoon. And it launched three months later on November 12th, 2014, uh, coming up on eight years ago. So now let me tell you what, uh, what to think about EMQQ and this story I'm about to tell you. It's, it, it wasn't as clear to me back then that what was going on. Uh, when I, you know, the, more, the same day I got that call, in the morning I had been looking at my own portfolio, which was invested in five stocks very concentrated. And there were five stocks that I thought were the best way to play this emerging market consumer story. The first three stocks, as you might imagine, were in the emerging market consumer ETF. Those three companies traded in Hong Kong were Want Want, which is a branded snack food company, think Nabisco, if you will. And the second and third companies were like Reebok and Converse, Chinese sportswear companies leaning and peak sports. So those were my first three companies, food, clothing, traditional consumption. But I had two other stocks in my portfolio. One of them trading on the New York Stock Exchange was Wuba, that's the Craigslist of China. And the fifth and final company trades on the NASDAQ, it's called Mercado Libre, M-E-L-I. And I looked at my portfolio and I thought, well, all five of these are my best investments to invest in this emerging market consumer story. But only three of them are in the ETF I recommend. Those three are great. They're growing at 15%, 20%. I think they have moats in form of brand equity. But the two internet companies were growing at over 100%, seven times as fast, and had fabulous margins. And they weren't included in the emerging market consumer ETF because the database said they were technology companies. And so when my friend called me, I thought, wait a minute, there's a different version of consumption in the world now. And so let me tell you what really the, the story is here. There's three megatrends happening at the same time. I didn't appreciate this as much as I see it now. And we are part of all of these three trends, but we were the first people involved. And I think perhaps we've lost perspective on where the rest of the world stands in terms of a couple of other things uh, beyond this. So we've already covered this. We've had consumption in my family for generations now. I have uh, a closet full of clothing. I've got a couple cars. I've got kids in college. I take vacations. 
I have this. Most of the world is just now getting their first uh, meal out at a restaurant, their first uh, pair of, of uh, athletic shoes. Everything we take for granted, the world's getting today and tomorrow. That's the first mega trend. Now, when I got that call eight years ago, I answered it on my iPhone, which was sitting on my car seat. But it was pretty new. I had only had it for a couple of years, and I could already see how it was changing my family's consumption. My family had gone to the Target store four times a week, and all of a sudden, uh, they went once a week. And so if you think about how the smartphone changed us, well, but remember, I had a computer for 20 years before I got a smartphone. The, the rest of the world has never had a computer before. So all of these billions of new consumers are also getting their first computer. It's not a desktop in the way we would think about it. It's a $100 Android-based smartphone made in China. It, it's getting better every year and more affordable every year. So the computer is reaching the world at a very fast pace. In India alone, 7 million people a month are getting their first ever computer, and uh, it's bringing with it not just a computer, but the internet, which I've had for 25 years, starting in 1995 in the Marina District of San Francisco on a telephone line. So while I've been wired for a couple and a half decades now, the rest of the world's never been wired. And so all of these people are getting their first computer, their first internet access, and very importantly, because the consumption infrastructure in emerging markets is by definition underdeveloped, um, and when I say underdeveloped, uh, when I say consumption infrastructure, I mean nobody has a bank account with a debit card. Uh, there's no Target store to go to even if you had a car, and there's no cable television on the wall. So these consumers are leapfrogging what we think of as traditional consumption and are in many ways more digital than we are. Now, what's the fundamental result? Massive growth. You take these three mega trends, you uh, take what McKinsey's called the biggest growth opportunity in the history of capitalism, and you've turbocharged it with the computer and the information age, and you've gotten a sector that has had, I believe, unprecedented growth. This is showing you the revenue for the emerging markets internet uh, index, uh, which our flagship EMQQ tracks. And you can see that's an average annual growth rate for more than 10 years of almost 38% a year. Now, I'm not positive of anything in the world, but I'm pretty sure this is not only the fastest growing sector in the world, but indeed the fastest growing sector in the world ever in terms of public companies and their revenue. And I have a $100,000 reward if you could show me a sector that ever did this uh, before, 38% revenue growth on average for 10 years plus. So that's the result, huge growth. And what is the result for investors? Well, if you look at this line, you'll see the emerging markets internet sector in gold, the broad traditional index along the bottom in black. Now, obviously there's been a huge correction a crash, whatever you want to call it, uh, but still investors are way ahead in this sector than they would be in the broad index. And let me point out that MSCI index bouncing along the bottom, it's got a 34% return over these 12 and a half years, but the 15 year return, zero. So now what are the companies driving this? Alibaba and Tencent, the Chinese uh, super apps have driven this. Uh, they've been the biggest drivers of the stories. They've digitized everything in China from uh, commerce to healthcare to entertainment to food and groceries and ultimately to fintech and banking. Um, and it's not just Alibaba. China's also got some very large uh, internet companies beyond those two, Pinduoduo, JD, Meituan, Baidu. So um, China's led this there's all sorts of problems in China and around China. People don't understand China. A lot, shockingly, a lot of investors don't seem to understand investing. Um, but either way, we've had a huge crash and there's lots of fears. Uh, the biggest fear is the one that I think is the stupidest and nobody should care about. It's the delisting fear. But even though I don't think it's worth spending any time on, uh, 
it seems to be able to move the market in huge ways. People somehow think that delisting meat, they're going to uh, lose all their money. So that this whole thing is, is gross on so many levels, including the fact that the main reason that the, we haven't proceeded with the Chinese and working out this accounting thing is the accounting watchdog, every one of their board members and executives was fired last July and was just replaced effectively uh, in January when the final board members, new board members were sworn in. So the accounting watchdog, a disgrace. And if you wanna see uh, something that you won't see too often in the paper, find this uh, story and expose on this gross uh, accounting watchdog. So let's move on from China and talk about what is going on beyond China. And um, now the world's got all sorts of issues right now. I think the biggest issue that we have is that China hasn't had the COVID, but it's there and they're trying to battle it. And they aren't gonna be able to do zero COVID without serious civil unrest and um, economic damage. And if they don't do co zero COVID, then they're gonna have perhaps a million or two uh, people die. And that's what we should be worried about with China. But beyond China, there's troubles as well. But the long-term story of this uh, internet uh, thing is, is very bright. And let me show you some important ways to think about this. Now, as mentioned, we did launch an additional uh, product, which is just the same thing as EMQQ, but without China. But let me show you why that's, uh, well, beyond the obvious, let me tell you what is, I think, very compelling about uh, this. If you look at China, it may be an emerging market in the traditional sense, but uh, its e-commerce market is four times as big as all of the other um, emerging and frontier markets combined, right? It is it is the most developed e-commerce market, whether it's an emerging market or not, that's the fact. And it's dominated uh, the EMQQ portfolio and the EMQQ story. You can see it's about half of the, of the of the weight. Here on a fundamental basis, you can see the revenue is 80% China. The gold is showing, this is showing you the same revenue. This time the gold is uh, China and uh, the purple are the other 45 emerging and frontier markets. And you can see they have just reached a critical mass uh, in the fourth quarter of last year of 100 billion in annualized revenue, which is where the China companies were eight years ago. There's four times as many people in that uh, uh, purple part. So four times as many people beyond China in India, Indonesia, Vietnam, Nigeria, the next frontier, if you will. And their e-commerce is just getting started on a population weighted basis. It's about 4% e-commerce penetration versus almost 30% now in China. So you got four times as many people and they're in the first inning. So what we have coming is a third internet wave and it's going to be uh, very big and it's facing headwinds right now for sure as is uh, most of the world but it's going to happen and it's going to go on for a decade uh, or more as the next five billion people get online. So um, when you think about the way the internet or the smartphone-based internet uh, showed up in our world. Really, we're talking about something that started in the year 2000 with Amazon, Yahoo, eBay. Uh, Google came on uh, a few years later. And then S-curve, sort of a, a 10 to 15-year S-curve, where these FANG stocks basically ate our lives and devoured the market cap of the S&P 500. Now the same thing happened in China, but it started about five years later, but it was still pretty early with Tencent and Alibaba. Baidu actually went public before Google and that S curve went, call it from 2005 to 2020, the steepest parts of that. And now beyond, uh, Ch beyond China, this third wave is cooking. And let me tell you where you can see this, I think the best, I just did, uh, a few weeks in Latin America uh, to visit uh, some of these companies. We went to Mexico City, Bogota, Buenos Aires, uh, Montevideo, Sao Paulo, and Rio. And, and 
it reinforced, in, in, not only did it reinforce some of my feelings about this story, it actually doubled my conviction on what's going to happen and the growth that's going to continue here. And so in Latin America, this story all starts with Mercado Libre, which I assume, again, some of you know, I mentioned it earlier. It's the company that sort of inspired me to see that inspired me to see that the story was happening not just in China, but all over the world. In every country, the smartest kids go to Harvard or Stanford. They go to work for you know, Apple or Google or Microsoft, and then they go back and start their, uh, their own internet companies. And in 1999, the three founders of uh, Mercado Libre uh, wrote the business plan for Mercado Libre in the library in Palo Alto. They went home, they started in a garage, it worked. The company grew to have a market cap over 100 billion at one point, which I think it will get to again. And they got rich and the investors got rich. And then those early employees and executives start to branch out and start additional internet companies, or in the case of two of the founders, a venture capital firm, Cossack. Those two guys then for a fund, the smartest guy from Bogota, who also goes to Stanford, and he builds the largest online bank in the world, which just went public in December. Berkshire Hathaway, the last private investor before the IPO. So this virtuous cycle is happening all over the world. And I, um, it is very big. And, and most of it's not getting captured in the indexes. Here you can see the, where these guys are going to school and gals. And they dominate uh, the Ivy, Ivy League schools. Most of these companies aren't in the index. Only two of our Latin companies are in the index. This is another big problem with uh, the traditional approach. Ventures, capital's pouring in. There's unicorns uh, in every country. Again, you can see where they went to college, 30 unicorns in Latin America. And all over the world, it's the same thing. Southeast Asia, Korea, Indonesia, Poland. The internet is going. Uh, crazy in a good way, entrepreneurs, venture funding, there's an incredible virtuous cycle going on in all of these markets. Now, there's going to be a vicious cycle here in the short term, but this will continue. Kazakhstan's got a super app publicly traded in London. Egypt, Fari, FinTech. Nigeria's Jumia. And finally, India. Now, as mentioned, we do have a discrete India offering. And let me just tell you what you need to know about India and why you want to care. And it's pretty simple. It's the biggest population in the world, or at least it will be very quickly. It's the youngest population in the world by far. It's got the fastest growing GDP. So it's, young, it's the biggest population, youngest, fastest growing GDP. All that growth is going to swell the middle class. You can see what will happen uh, over the next 10 years there. And what's the first thing they all want? A smartphone. And it's also, add all those things together, the fastest growing e-commerce market in the world. And finally, it's a democracy, which may or may not be the best way to get growth, but certainly favorable uh, to other forms of government, uh, perhaps. Um, but whether it's a the uh, democracy or not, the guy in charge right now, Modi, is all in on digitizing the country. His whole platform is Digital India, and he's doing it, and they've taken cash out of circulation or attempted to, to start to do that. They've digitized all their services. So the story in India is shaping up uh, to be very exciting. The critical mass was reached in terms of public companies so we can make an index. We need 20, we got 22. Two years ago, they had three. So the IPOs were starting to flow. The FinTech leader went public at the top last uh, fall. This stock's down about 70%. Berkshire Hathaway has been an investor for five years. This is again, the payments leader in India. Food delivery, Zomato. These delivery businesses work really well in emerging markets where you've got low labor costs, and dense populations. Uh, online beauty products, second self-made woman billionaire, founder of Nika. Again, the IPO pipeline has shut. India's markets might be a little more insulated than other markets. It's, most of these companies are going public in India, so they may actually get IPOs done in this terrible 
uh, environment, but there's certainly a number of uh, scaled companies. Goldman Sachs thinks there could be 200 internet IPOs out of India. So, um, so this story, you know, beyond the economics and the investment opportunity, people's lives are changing around the world at an incredible rate. I mean, we've had, again, a very gradual relationship with technology. These people are going from zero to a thousand and it's happening, as mentioned uh, in India, 7 million a month getting uh, online and uh, digitized. So people's lives are changing. Most of it's good. Some things get disrupted in terms of society, but by and large, this is a good story. So in summary, this is all about growth. I think it's an unprecedented story of growth. These three mega trends uh, coming together at the same time and these billions of people leapfrogging traditional consumption. Side benefit in a part of the world where corporate governance is your biggest problem, you actually get very good corporate governance. And I can't tell you enough how uh, bullish I am on this story long term in ter these ecosystems. Every country has its own Silicon Valley now, and the story is the same. Harvard and Stanford for the smartest locals go to work for Google or Amazon and start your own, and it's continuing and accelerating. Current market conditions are going to cause a, a retrenchment, but this is uh, uh, the first inning for most of the world. So evaluations, compelling. Again, we've been crushed. Uh, you wouldn't know we had 35% revenue growth. Uh, we were down 70% at one point. Um, so that's the end of my talk. If anybody wants to get a hold of us, you can do so here. And obviously, Michael... Uh, and his team can uh, also uh, direct you our way. So Michael, I don't see any questions and I think I'm right up at my time. So I'm gonna say thank you very much. And Evan, thank you. you. Thank you very much um, for your presentation today. Uh, very, very interesting stuff. I really enjoyed um, you know, how you cover this opportunity each time. And um, you know, I hope the economic conditions don't uh, continue to you know, get bad and we see some improvement and, you know, I'm, I'm a, a big believer in your story and I always appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you again.